Okay, again, this morning we are focusing on the sovereignty of God, and more particularly the sovereignty or the authority that is entrusted to Jesus during this time. As we saw last week, He is our King, and how that includes all things, and how our Lord directs all things for our good. But let's, let me just read one other passage. As we begin, Ephesians 1, verses 11 and 12, and I think you'll, you'll see the operative words in here. Paul says, also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Okay, the operative words are that he works all things after the counsel of his will. All right, now, <clears throat> we have seen that we should love God for so many things, okay? not the least of which for His infinite mercy in giving us the only one who, who could possibly have been our mediator, the only one who could possibly have stood between us to reconcile us, and we know that that is Jesus. We've seen that we should love Jesus for His work as mediator in revealing God's love for us, um, uh, again, even in the Old Testament, uh, through his prophets, and certainly as he comes into the world and through those who, whom he gave his spirit to give a scripture, revealing God's love to us in him and showing us how we can love him in return, Christ as our prophet. Uh, we should love him for giving his life for us, enduring God's wrath for us on the cross, which we would have had to endure for all eternity. Christ took that on himself and paid the price and ascending into heaven to pray for us as our priest. And last week we saw that we should love him for, for his work as king. Jesus is the one who by his Holy Spirit has overcome our sinful hearts. He is the one who governs us through his law of, of love. He is the one who defends us from everything in this world that could possibly harm us. He's the one who trains us for the spiritual warfare that we're involved in so that we can stand against our enemies. And we should thank him as king that his, he's continually and systematically subduing all of our enemies as he advances his kingdom in this world. And you know, as bad as things look in the world right now, and certainly there have been places where the kingdom of heaven has seemingly been you know, much more powerfully evident there are still, I believe today, many more believers than there have been at any time in history, though there are also many more people. I do believe that God's kingdom is advancing, and I do believe that one day it will fill the earth. You know, Jesus has that promise of his Father, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. And that is going to come to pass before Jesus returns, because the last enemy we saw that he will return to vanquish his death. But again, there are still more reasons why we should love him. And this morning, we want to consider what I've already been talking about. We should love him because of his absolute sovereignty. Jesus directs everything that is happening in this world, and he directs these things for our good. Now, as we focus on this topic, I, I want us to think about a couple of things. You know, we, we want to focus on the greatness of Christ, you know, how great he is, how wonderful he is in his absolute sovereignty and authority. So we can marvel at that. I mean, that, that is a wonderful thing, and we should focus on that. But also how great his love is towards us in using that authority to work all things, and even the evil, even our own personal sins, together for our good. So first of all, let's look at the fact that Jesus directs all things, that he is in control of the world. And Paul writes, in, again, Ephesians 1.11, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, that is referring to God, generally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we do know that before Jesus was exalted, that is how things were done, okay? God was directing all things, you know, more, um, you might say more directly, you know, the, the, tr the triune God was doing so. 
But now that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God, God governs the world through his son. Okay, this control has been handed over to him. And, you know, one thing sort of struck me that I thought was, was, inter was interesting. Something that Sinclair Ferguson brought up in the context of the creation, okay, where he says that, you know, in the beginning, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light. Okay, so the Father speaks. The word that is spoken is the word of God, you know, the, who is Christ, the, the Logos. And then the Spirit's hovering over the creation, over the waters, so to speak, and He's the one that, that is taking that command, that creative word, and He's executing it, right? He's the one who's bringing these things about. So the Father speaks, the Son is the one through whom the Father makes all things, and the Spirit of God is the one bringing this all about. Well, that's exactly how things are working today, and that's how we need to think about this. You know, the Father still has His plan. He's speaking. Christ is the one who's controlling. And as, as he directs in his sovereign control of all things, the Spirit of God is the one bringing these things about as we see the Spirit, as you're reading the book of Acts, right? Set apart for me, you know, Paul and, and Barnabas to the work that I've called them. And so he's the one directing what's going on. He's the one who's applying Christ, breathing new life. He's the one who is advancing the kingdom of heaven. So the triune God is involved in all these things. But Christ is the one who is now currently ruling and reigning. After he made sacrifice, atonement for our sin, he, he was exalted to the right hand of God with that ongoing promise. Another point of interest, Jonathan Edwards noted this, that that means that Jesus now exalted as king at the right hand of God in control of all things. It means that Jesus' abilities have dramatically increased over what they were on earth. You know, think about this. When Jesus said on one occasion, the, the, you know, when he was talking about his return, actually not his return, it's more like his, his return in judgment against, you know, Israel in 70 AD. Of that day and hour, no one knows, you know, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, but the Father only. And he was speaking from his human nature. There were certain things he didn't know. But now that he is governing the universe, now that he is you know, governing all the things that are going on in this world, that has vastly increased. His knowledge has increased. Um, governing every detail in the world requires that you know a vast number of things. Jonathan Edwards used the term infinite. But, but really, a finite creation can't have an infinite number of things to know. So it, it's vast. I mean, he, he must know a lot of things. And the fact that he's directing them according to God's plan, you have to have power. But that's exactly what Jesus is doing, you see, as the God-man. He is directing all things according to God's plan, and uh, you have to have a great deal of power to do that, especially when you consider what else he is doing, okay? Now, Jesus has these things. Now, as the God-man exalted to the right hand of God, we read in Hebrews 1, verse 3, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. And just quickly, I want us to note, Jesus is the radiance, the author to the Hebrews says, the radiance or the brightness of God's glory. Just as there is a sun, and, and I should say the sun in the sky, and the light that shines from the sun, so there is the Father, and there is the glory that radiates from Him. The author to the Hebrews says that Christ is that glory. He is that brightness. And some believe that this is a reference to the eternal generation of the sun. Jesus is the glory of God. Secondly, the author says that Jesus is the exact representation of his nature. You know, as the Son of God, he has the same essence as the Father. He is the same being. Remember what uh, Paul says in Philippians 2. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking upon himself our nature. So as the Son of God, he is the same being. Yes, the exact representation. But I think also, and perhaps what, what he has more in mind here, is the character. 
that Jesus shares. You know, being the same characters as the uh, Father, as the God-man, He comes into the world in order to reveal who the Father is to us. John says of Jesus in John 1.18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, notice begotten God, the eternally begotten one, He has explained Him. That is, He has, you know, the word is exegete. It's, it's essentially what you do when you, when you go to the Word of God and you're trying to figure out what it says, you know. Exegete, it means you're, you're sort of working with the language here and you're trying to understand it. Well, Jesus comes into the world in order to explain to us exactly who the Father is. He shares that same character. So he is the brightness or the radiance of his glory. He is the exact representation of his nature. Jesus is glorious. But then this third point, he is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. Now that means two things. First of all, it means that Jesus is the one who keeps everything in existence. He is the one, um, let me, I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, but he also is the one who moves everything along according to God's plan. Now, what, what we're talking about here is, is what we call divine providence, okay? The Shorter Catechism addresses that, and perhaps you're familiar with that. It asks us the question, what are the works of providence? And it answers in this way. God's works of providence are his most holy wise and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. Now, we know that God's plan, his, his eternal decree, which is, includes absolutely everything and is absolutely sovereign, includes two things, creation and providence. Creation is where God makes all things out of nothing, right? There's no pre-existing matter um, all things come into being by him, John writes, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Call that creation ex nihilo. God simply calls it into existence, but again, we'll, we'll talk about his upholding here in just a moment. Providence is that upholding, that sustaining of the creation, the preserving of it, and the directing and governing of everything he has made to a specific end. Now, the author to the Hebrews that tell, tells us that, that Jesus is also doing this. And, and when you think about all the details involved in this, it, it's just, it, it's a lot, right? It, it's more than we can possibly imagine. Jesus is actively keeping us, first of all, upholding us in existence. He keeps us in being. We know that from Scripture, there is only one being who can exist in and of himself, who doesn't need anyone else to exist. He doesn't depend on anyone else, and that is God. But we are creatures, and we depend on him. Everything God has made depends on, on him for their existence at every moment. Jesus is the one who is actually holding us up in being. And he's keeping us, as it were, from just simply falling into non-existence. I want to put it that way. If, if he were to let go, we would disappear. We would become nothing, essentially. And the idea of, you know, some people are afraid of that, uh, that idea of, you know, when I die, there's absolute nothingness, because that's what most people probably believe, even though they're afraid of death. Uh, they, it's more than that. That's what they would say if you ask them. I, I, the idea of just nothingness is, is a scary thing. Yeah, and actually, when they see what's on the other side, those who haven't trusted Christ, they would wish that it were nothingness, right? But Jesus is the one who keeps us from going into nothingness. And that's another reason, of course, why we should love him. He not only preserves us from going into non-existence, but he has prepared a glorious place for us uh, in the future. But as I've said, it's really the second aspect of his upholding all things that we want to focus on this morning. The fact that he directs all things to God's holy, uh, according to God's holy and perfect plan. 
He is in absolute control of all things. And we've probably heard before that he must be sovereignly in control of all things. Or he is ultimately in control of nothing. Maybe some of you have heard R.C. Sproul's treatment of this. Where he talks about <clears throat> the maverick molecule. If God, or Christ in this case, is not in absolute control of everything, then there, if there's something outside of his control, that thing could feasibly thwart his plans. It could, it could get in the way. You know, maybe you've, um, if you're into science fiction and you've, you ever you know, hear about some of the conundrums that are created by time travel, which is impossible, I think. But if you could time travel and go back in history, it's been said that if you went back into history and you moved a grain of sand, or maybe more modernly the idea is if you go back in time and step on a butterfly, okay, uh, you will old, you know, you'll ultimately change the, the whole course of history. That something so small could, could affect what, what is actually taking place in this world. Well, the fact is, Jesus is in control of every grain of sand. He's in control of every butterfly that lives or dies. He is in absolute sovereign control. And Scripture tells us that he exercises this control in, in various ways. Now, the way that he normally controls things is according to the laws of nature. You know, we call them the laws of nature. But what we should really see that as is the way that Jesus is ordinarily doing things in this world, okay? Um, the sun travels from east to west, right? Rises in the east, sets in the west. Shadows move in the opposite direction of the sun. When you step into, um, you know, deep water, like if you stepped into your neighbor's swimming pool or if you happen to have a swimming pool, you're not going to actually stand on the water. You're going to go down. That's just the way things ordinarily work. When it rains, things get wet. But sometimes the Lord does things differently, doesn't he? And we call those things miracles, okay? So there's the ordinary laws of, of physics. That is Jesus working in the ordinary way. But sometimes he grants exceptions to that, miracles. When he does things differently, there's a case in the Bible where the sun stood still for an entire day uh, so that Joshua could uh, defeat God's enemies with, with his armies. Uh, there was a time when instead of the, uh, the, sun, the shadow moving one direction, it moved the other direction. And that was to confirm to Hezekiah that he would live and not die. Uh, there was, of course, the time when Jesus stepped out of the water or out of the boat and into the water. And he walked on the water. And even Peter, for a time, uh, did that. So sometimes our Lord, in his sovereignty, um, you know, will work differently than he ordinarily works. Uh, the second main area that Jesus is working his will is, is he is also using the, the decisions that people are making in this world to his, to his holy ends as well. They're what we call their, their free choices. You know, we call that free will. And free in the sense, in this sense, that he does not ever force anyone to choose against what it is they want. Now, when we talk about free will, we do have to be careful here because we know as, as uh, Bible-believing Christians, the Bible says that, that, you know, people come into this world, everyone comes into this world hating God. Um, they are not free to choose the good because they don't want the good. They love the evil, so they choose different kinds of evil, but they don't choose the good ever because it's good or holy. That's something that only a believer can do and only by the grace of God. But those free choices that Christians make and those free choices that unbelievers make, um, the Lord is also using together for, um, for His purposes, for His good. Um, he connects all these choices together in what we might call a causal nexus, as well as all the events that take place in this world, the natural evil that takes place in this world, so that the events and our choices, they're all, they all affect one another, okay? Our choices affect each other. The things that other people choose affect us. The events that take place in this world affect us. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, in his greatest work, arguably, called The Freedom of the Will, reminds us that 
All of our choices and all of these events are connected together. Uh, all these things that are going on around us are influencing our choices. Nobody ever makes a choice purely spontaneously without something influencing that choice. If somebody or something hurts us, we get angry. If we get angry, that can influence the way we respond. You know, I think the classic example is somebody gets angry at something going on in his house. He passes the dog on the way out. Instead of petting the dog, he kicks the dog, okay? The anger changes the way, you know, the decisions that we might make. Uh, Eve was tempted by the devil. That changed what she might otherwise have done. She disobeyed God. Okay, but again, even though these things are influencing us in this chain of cause and effect, we're still responsible for the choices that we make. So Jesus is governing all things by certain laws. Sometimes he, he intervenes through miracles. There are choices that are being made um, by human beings and things that are going on in this world, and these are all being governed by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus sometimes intervenes into history in various ways. Uh, think about um, judgment, right? Um, 70 AD, when Jesus told the high priest he would see the Son of Man coming on the clouds in glory, I, I believe he was referring to his coming in judgment. Christ intervenes with acts of judgment. Think about what uh, Paul says, that the wrath of God is being revealed every day against unrighteousness and wickedness of men. Those judgments are interventions, but the Lord also intervenes with blessings, doesn't he? Sometimes granting prosperity, sometimes granting supernatural healing, sometimes pouring out his spirit in great revivals such as the Great Awakening. And of course, the Lord intervenes when he sends the Holy Spirit to breathe new life into those whom he's saving. Now again, all of these are different ways that our great and glorious king is governing the universe. He's using all of these things to direct history. You know, again, the laws of physics, his ordinary way of working things, sometimes intervening with miracles. He's using, and judgments and blessings. Um, even our actions, even our choices, the Lord is, is in control of all these things. And the thing that's most amazing is the fact that he even uses the choices we make for, for his particular ends, okay? He works all of these things together for one particular goal, and that is the glory of God. And the fact that he can, like I said, represents a tremendous expansion of the ability of our Lord Jesus Christ from what we see on earth, you know, because we're talking about the man, Christ Jesus, who is now governing the universe. And this is how he does it to this particular end. And that should make us, first of all, stop and marvel at the majesty and glory of our great king. But now, this is the thing that impacts us perhaps a little bit more intimately. Jesus is governing and directing all these things together for our good. We read in our meditation, and by the way, when we read that God does this, we need to remember, it, just like in creation, He speaks, Jesus is the word that's spoken, the Spirit takes it and, and works it out. So it is in this case. Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, God is working everything in your life together for good, all things, okay? The good and the evil that he allows. Now, the good we can understand, but how does the Lord use evil for good? The physical evil that takes place in this world. You know, there's two different kinds of evil. In the perfect world God created, there weren't earthquakes and tidal waves and cyclones and tornadoes and things like that. There wasn't disease. We call these natural evils because there's no moral, you know, malice or intent behind it. But how does he use that for our good? And even more importantly, how does he use moral evil for our good? You know, our own evil and that of others. 
Well, we began looking last week in the book of James, remember, and, and something I'm, I, I'm just repeating because we're going to get into this a little bit more deeply this evening. We considered, first of all, what this evil is, okay? It isn't something that, that actually exists. It's not something. But on the other hand, it's not an illusion, you know? Evil is, a real, is, is something that's real, but it, it's not something created. Because if it was, God must have, would have had to create it, but James has already told us that God is not the author of evil. And his creatures couldn't create it because creatures don't have creative power. So it's not a thing. Rather, it is the absence of something. It is the absence of good. It is the absence of the Spirit of God. Lucifer chose to disobey God. And when he did, he lost the Spirit and he became evil. The big question is, why did he make that choice? That's what R.C. is going to deal with this evening. But then he tempts Adam and Eve. At least Eve had another reason why she disobeyed God. There was somebody deceiving her, but Lucifer didn't have that. Okay? But when they fell, they lost the spirit, and they became like the devil. We also saw last week why it is that God allowed evil to come into his creation, and that was because of the good that he would work out of it. Now, again, this evening, R.C. is going to deal with those two points, but he's going to delve more intimately into the question of how do these good creatures actually rebel against God. But the question we're asking this evening is, okay, we, we acknowledge that, that evil is here. How does God use it for good? That's the reason why he allows it. But how does he use it for good? Well, how does he use natural evil for good? Sickness, disease, how do, you know, death. How does he use that for good? Well, well, let's ask ourselves this question. You know, what, what is it that we experience when we get sick? Okay? Think about it. Doesn't, it. doesn't it have the effect of showing us our limitations? Doesn't it, in some regards, show us our dependence on God? Doesn't it humble us by showing us that, that weakness and the fact that we do depend on the Lord for everything? Doesn't it drive us to Him in prayer to ask the Lord for His mercies to heal us? Doesn't it, you know, again, cause us to ask God for healing and strength to continue in our illness? Remember what Paul did when he was afflicted by a messenger of Satan. He prayed and asked the Lord three times that God might remove this affliction, but the Lord told him that in his weakness, God's strength is perfected. And as Paul, of course, responded to that, he, he said, I'm well content to be in this weakness so that I might experience God's strength. God always has a good purpose behind these things he brings into our lives. They humble us, they drive us to God, uh, to, again, remind us of our dependence upon him, that it's really his strength and, and not ours. And also, when we think about how the Lord oftentimes delivers us from those afflictions, doesn't it move us to praise him when he heals us, if he heals us? And if he doesn't heal us, and if it is a sickness to death, doesn't the Lord use it to take us to heaven where we really will be praising him? And doesn't all of that teach us to use our time more wisely when, when, when we're in this life? You know, the, the same is true of all forms of natural evil. When people undergo an earthquake and they lose things that are precious to them, hurricanes, same thing, tornado, disease. When things are going well for us, we don't seek the Lord nearly as much as when things don't go well for us. We don't learn nearly as much about God, again, when things are going well. But we certainly learn a lot when things go hard. So we need to remember God uses those things to help us become more like Christ. And they do make us more like Christ if we belong to Him. Now, if we don't belong to Him, they make us bitter and perhaps increase our hatred of Him. And that's one of the ways we can know whether we know the Lord or not, is whether these trials are actually making us love Him more or not love Him more, okay? But if we are believers, they actually do increase our love for Him. 
But now what about moral evil? Um, he, he can use moral evil in the same way. He uses the sins of others, for instance, to bring about these same things. What, what is the response when you are afflicted by other people? Isn't, doesn't, isn't it the same thing as the illness, you know? When somebody attacks you, if somebody injures you, it brings about, again, the sense of your weakness, your dependence upon God, brings about humility. It drives you to the Lord in prayer. When He delivers you, same thing happens as when you read the Psalms, you know, where they were undergoing some great difficulty. They cry out to the Lord. The Lord delivers them. And then they praise Him. And they give Him glory for His great love and His great mercy. After we've gone through these things, again, we are closer to God. And of course, if He might kill us through others, He will take us, simply take us to heaven, right? And that's a good thing as well. Stephen was stoned to death, but after he was stoned, what happened? We say, well, poor Stephen, you know, it um, didn't actually work out for his good because now he's dead. Well, no, because Stephen was taken up into heaven. Stephen was given the honor of being a martyr for Christ. And we, we look at the end of the book of Revelation, and martyrs are singled out as those who will be most highly honored. Jesus said on one occasion, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid his life down for us. When we lay down our lives for him, that is the greatest honor because it is the greatest act of love. So he uses those attacks of moral evil, the, the hatred of others against him directed at us. He can work that together for our good. But he can even use our own personal sins, our own moral failures in the same way for our good. I, I thought for this I would just simply read what the Westminster Assembly says in the Confession. I think it's very, actually the Confession and the Catechism, very insightful. Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 5, Section 5. Our most wise, righteous, and gracious God often leaves for a time his own children to various temptations and the corruption of our own, uh, of our own hearts to chasten us. Uh, excuse me, I think I must have, uh, I reworded this. That's what happened, and I missed the first one. Okay. So think about this in terms. So our most wise, right, righteous, and gracious God often leaves for a time us, okay, to various temptations and the corruption of our own hearts to chasten us for our previous sins or to show us the hidden strength of corruption and the deceitfulness of our hearts that we may be humbled and to raise us to a closer and more constant dependence for our support on Him and to make us more watchful against all future occasions of sin and for various other just and holy ends. So the Lord has a good purpose even for allowing temptation and sin in our lives. Now, God usually is restraining our sins. The Spirit of God is holding back the corruption in our hearts. But the assembly realized there are times when He doesn't do that. And He doesn't so that he might show us again how much we really do depend on him, how much corruption there really is to humble us, to drive us to him in prayer for the strength to overcome our sins, to make us more careful to avoid the things that actually cause us to fall into sin, the things that tempt us, and for many other reasons, all of which are good. Now, James, remember, tells us that our trials all of which arise either from natural or moral evil are meant to help us in some way. This is how it helps us. So Jesus is, is governing all these things for our good because we, because we love him and because, most of all, because he loves us. But you know, one thing that also we can't, we can't miss, and that is that Jesus is even going to work the, the thing that perhaps we... You know, we, we wish hadn't happened most of all. Uh, even the fall. He's going to work the fall together for our good. Now, if Adam d had not sinned, we would have lived in a perfect world. And we would have, you know, been given the cultural mandates and also the mandate to multiply and fill the earth. But to multiply, fill the earth, subdue the earth, 
make it yield its potential for the glory of God. Now, that's, that's ongoing right now. Um, the earth is yielding its potential. I mean, just, again, think about a tablet. You know, think about uh, all the electronics we have. Think about all the things that have been discovered by God's grace, okay? So, but it's not being done for His glory. It's being done for the glory of man right now, but God is still giving us good gifts, so forth. Well, if there had been no fall, this would have happened a lot faster. The earth would have been populated, it would have been subdued, and when everything was finished and everyone was born that the Lord had planned to bring into the world, He would have eventually moved us all into the eternal state where we would continue to live in a perfect world, but now glorified. Well, that would have been wonderful, right? That would have been, I mean, I don't think any of us would, would you know, not want to be a part of a future like that or a world like that. But we need to understand that the fall having taken place, Christ having come into the world to do what he did, makes our future, not the future of everyone, you know, we know it's going to happen to the vast majority of mankind. They're going to end up in hell. But for those of us whom the Lord has saved, our future is going to be even more glorious than it would have been through this other perfect scenario. Uh, because the kingdom that we are now going to receive is not simply, you know, that which God had, had planned uh, to, to bring His perfect world into, but rather it is the reward of the God-man that, that, that we're going to receive. And it may be kind of hard to visualize or sort of quantify exactly what the differences would be. All we can say is it's going to be much more glorious because what Jesus does as the God-man is worthy of a greater reward than what a mere perfect human being does. Exactly how, I would have to say, you know, Jesus' love for the Father is much greater. And His humbling Himself to be a servant is much greater than anything any perfect human being would ever do. And so the reward for that is just much greater. And Jesus shares that reward for us or with us, right? So Jesus is in absolute control of all things. And he uses that authority to direct everything that happens in this world, even evil, even the fall, for our good. And so, again, I, I submit to all of us this morning, how much should we love him okay, for that, for, for who he is, his glory and his greatness and that love that he shows us in working all these things together ultimately for our good. Well, we should love him as he calls us to with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. He should be the very center of our lives. The reason we make every decision we make in this world should be to honor and glorify Him. And really, that alone, even to love our neighbor, is to love Him. So we need to think about that as, as, we, as we do. Let's, let's just bow in a moment of prayer. And as we prepare to come to the table, Let's pray that God would give to us, again, the right response to some of the things that we've been reminded of this morning. Again, to love the Lord in that way. So let's, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer as we prepare to come to the table.